So if we want to handle a large number of loads within Emulate 3D, then we need to potentially make some compromises in order to have our model run at a reasonable speed. We could just buy more expensive hardware um, so that we can run the model with the same level of detail and our computer just crunches through the numbers and allows us to still run at a reasonable run speed. Or we could do things like buying um, second sets of, of hardware and splitting up our model into multiple parts that communicate with each other using telegrams or scripting to pass loads between them. So we split an emulate 3D model across uh, multiple different computers. Or probably a little bit more cost effectively, um, we could just optimize how we're doing these calculations inside emulate 3D to still get the results we want and um, just use a single instance of emulate 3D with the computer we're on. So how can we optimize our system to handle large numbers of loads? And when I'm talking about large numbers of loads, it's not the kind of numbers that emulate 3D handles fine, which is hundreds or low thousands of loads. We're talking about tens of thousands or more loads in a system. The way we normally do this is recommend using linear physics as a starting point. And that's just gonna strip away all of those physics calculations and really simplify them down. So you've probably seen something like this beforehand. Uh, just a simple conveyor and if we're running in volumetric physics we can see that we're governing how these objects move with forces and friction and they bounce around really nicely this is good for certain applications especially if we're going to be modeling um, small subunits right the behavior of a merge or a divert or perhaps um, a piece of machinery which we're controlling via a plc then volumetric physics is perfect for this if we're trying to model an entire fulfillment center, then this is overkill. We don't need to be modeling the friction coefficient between our um, box and our belt. All we need to know is that the belt moves at a certain speed and therefore the box moves with it, right? So we can simplify our calculations and swap from our proper physics calculations to a more abstract representation. This is a discrete event simulation, um, which is a, a method of doing these types of, of simulations. And we've got two options here with different levels of, of detail. And linear physics is the one which is going to run really fast. And you can think of it as being just us creating paths for where loads need to travel through conveyors or through robots or through vehicles. And we just animate them along. So there's no physics. We're just animating them according to the properties on conveyors or vehicles or things like this. And our performance increases dramatically. So you can see in linear physics, we're churning away at thousands of times run speed, whilst in volumetric physics on this, this old laptop I have at home, we're running at tens of times run speed because of the calculations, which leads us to believe that in linear physics, we can model much, much larger systems. Now, linear physics has a few limitations. Uh, you can see this if we contrast linear physics against planar physics, which is the other discrete event simulation engine we have. It's kind of in its name. We try to give you this simple way of understanding it with volumetric being 3D, planar being 2D and linear being one dimensional. It's more subtle than that. There's more complexity going on. But that's a good way to really think about it in your mind. So you can see if we contrast if I turn off my center snap. Center snap there we, go. we see if we run this in, in volumetric physics, a system like this where we have loads going along side by side on a conveyor, everything works fine and loads tumble, right? They're moving in a three dimensional way. If we go and change it to planar physics, which is gonna run significantly faster, um, but it's still not actual proper physics. There's no forces, there's no friction going on but we still have enough detail and complexity to model loads going along side by side on this conveyor here. And then if we go to linear physics, which runs even faster still, then we see completely different behavior. You can actually think of each of your um, conveyors as being just a one dimensional path with no real associated width. And therefore we see, if I actually get these to snap together, sorry. Therefore, we see our loads only traveling down the middle of conveyors and we can't get them running side by side. 
So there's a limitation of linear physics that we can't get our loads running nice and side by side. And there's some applications where we might want to represent loads flowing in bulk along a conveyor. Actually, many cases when we want to have tens of thousands of loads in a system, we need to have lots and lots of loads lined up together in conveyors because we're looking at moving bottles or cans uh, or we're looking at unloading large numbers of parcels uh, all in one go on a conveyor. And we want to model them all in a great big heap and then they move along and they get singulated and they get sorted and separated out later on. So what I want to show you now is some techniques on how we can model those types of bulk flow using linear physics or much faster than volumetric physics approaches. And that will allow you to get the right sort of behavior and even the right sort of visualization whilst having significantly faster run speed. And that's critical if we're wanting to do emulation, so we've got to run at one times speed, uh, or if we're wanting to do simulations and we're impatient and don't want to wait lots and lots of time for our simulation to finish. So we're going to look at two different approaches here. We're going to look at a regular arrangement of loads, so things like cans and bottles moving along in a line that then move along in, in bulk, end up getting um, accumulated in buffers, and then they get singulated out into long queues before they get filled. And then we're going to look at a second case, which is lots of irregular loads in a heap. And that's, uh, that's used quite frequently in distribution centers and uh, parcels and postage, that kind, of, that kind of approaches. So I'll flash up what they might look like in volumetric, first of all. Let's have a look what I mean when I'm talking about regular flow of product. I'm going to run this in full physics. It's going to be overkill, and it will show you roughly how much at least my computer can handle in terms of volumetric physics loads. So here we have lots and lots and lots of cans being created by a load creator. Uh, hundreds and hundreds, and these are being modeled with volumetric physics, as you'll see in a second. And for these numbers, up to order of a thousand loads, a few thousand loads, Emulate 3D does perform very well. Um, we're, we're pleased, very pleased, especially with other, other products on the market, of how well Emulate 3D performs for large numbers of loads like this in our system. You can see that these are modeled properly with volumetric. If I start grabbing stuff, actually, let me grab, let me grab a slightly different model very quickly. Uh, I want to do, that will do, it's the right one. You can see that these are being modeled properly with physics. If I go and start disrupting things, it's all dynamic, right? You can see our load creators now spitting out loads on top of each other so that they, they bounce off each other. You can see it's all dynamic and we can actually run at fast forward speeds. So if I'm fast forwarding here, my computer can handle thousands of loads faster than real time. That's fine. But we're, we're reaching a bottleneck, right? We can't get that much more loads. We can't get that much faster uh, with this level of physics. Therefore, how can we model this type of system using reduced physics? Because really, do we need to have the, the contact points? Uh, do we need to have the forces modeled for each one of these cans as they're moving along or do we just want to represent them flowing from point to point and then perhaps model certain elements in more detail when it's actually important to, to model them with with uh, higher fidelity we could try to model this system using linear physics but if you remember from the start of this session linear physics basically has all of our loads running along a single path so they would be queuing up along a straight line and hey, that's not going to work because we've got loads 12, 13 across. Right. So linear physics is just going to be problematic. In fact, it just throws us an error. Won't, won't let you do it. Basically, we're trying to add loads on top of each other. So here's a nice technique which a lot of our customers will use if they want to represent this type of bulk flow. Using linear physics with much better performance. What they'll do is effectively cheat. <laughs> they'll take a conveyor and they'll turn off its sides. So they'll go and turn off its properties for its sides. So they'll go to its left side and right side and they'll just make it disappear and uh, maybe even remove its width for both of them. And then they'll get as many conveyors as they need for a number of loads wide that should be transported on that system. And they'll put them side by side. Here we've got a conveyor. Might even remove the start and end stands. And I'm going to set its width to be 0 
Yeah. Uh, 0 0.1, something small. And then to avoid myself going insane, I'm going to set the left and right connector and I'm going to stop them for trying to connect to things, which is going to be a really handy hint because otherwise these connectors are going to want to snap to other objects all the time. So turning off these auto connect on the connectors is helpful. And then I'm just going to get lots of these conveyors and I'm just going to put them side by side, basically. Arrange them really close to each other, side by side, all the way along. So I've done this earlier just to show you what that might look like. And this produces well, the ideal effect for a lot of our customers who want to model this sort of sort of flow in a fast way with a visual representation. Just lots of these conveyors, snap them together and place a load creator on each one with the loads being created at the right rate. And now we get nice flow. So this type of approach allows us to run linear physics really fast. And the other advantage is that we got a lot of stability here. We looked at that volumetric physics. It doesn't take much to snag or knock over a load and everything uh, becomes a mess. We're just wanting to do some sort of flow analysis of our system. And this approach of having lots of conveyors side by side is ideal. And what you could do once you built one of these is just add it to a catalog and reuse it. And when we get to things like these, these um, diverts uh, or these merges, what we can do is just connect up one conveyor to another, like so. The way linear physics works is purely on connections. We don't even care if two conveyors are close enough to each other for a load to pass between them. All the linear physics engine does is create paths along the conveyors and between the connections that bridge conveyors together. So this means that if we connect things up correctly, and we get nice behavior like this, where loads just jump from place to place in a nice ordered fashion. And then this runs really fast, right? It's, it's ideal. So this type of approach is a good starting point for that kind of um, regular bulk flow that we see in these different industries. And because we're running li our linear physics engine as normal, if we end up choosing our conveyors and we turn them off, we turn off their state, for example, then we'll see accumulation behavior, absolutely fine. And then we can turn it back on again. So we can get all of this nice behavior no problem at all, uh, which is useful for modeling the flow of product. We use this technique quite a lot. You'll see it in some of our um, larger models, our larger linear physics models. It's a convenient approach. And if we combine this with some other techniques for modeling areas like singulators, areas like buffers, areas like recirc, things like this, uh, then, then we can end up with quite nice flow of this regular product. One of the tools which is really useful for modeling these more complex areas are black boxes, which I'll show you in a second. Uh, here we have um, so something like singulation rates. Right? So we've got loads coming in. I think in this case, there's just boxes and we're wanting to take it from our multiple lanes side by side into a single lane. And then we might have this single narrow conveyor then spread out into uh, multiple lanes. Uh, so we we widen our conveyor and we might want to represent that now our loads are traveling parallel uh, to each other. This is really simple. All we need is just a black box straight out of a catalog. Nothing changed. I can just delete this and show it to you. Just a simple black box straight out of a catalog with no store time on it at all. And this black box, if it's got no store time on it and no custom logic on it, just represents uh, almost teleportation. We just and we put it to the other. But the black box has got logic to make sure loads don't end up on top of each other, and then we get nice, simple flow through our system. So you can imagine uh, in that last model I showed you, all I need to do is just set up more of these stations and just draw more of these connections, and then I could go and represent those 90 returns or represent those, um, those singulation, things like this. And the black box itself has different options for the release mode on how it chooses to output to different stations. And if you do things like a priority, for example, that can be really nice to represent the 90 degree turn because you want to make sure that you try to put loads closest to the inside of the turn. And if that's full, then you start pushing them further and further out to the outside. That makes a nice visual representation of that process. So parallel conveyors. Uh, with black boxes is a powerful approach for modeling these types of systems.